What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We come now to uh, the Word of God and what a privilege it is. And we're looking at the fourth chapter of Mark again and the parable of the soils that takes up the first twenty verses of this fourth chapter. So open your Bible to Mark chapter 4. This is message number three and will be the last message as we look at the parable of the soils. There is so much actually in the truth of this parable that... Uh, I suppose uh, one could do 10, 12, or even 20 messages just explaining the nuances of this parable, so by no means are we exhausting it in three messages. It is a familiar story to all students of the New Testament, one of the most familiar of all of Jesus' parables. Let's familiarize ourselves again with it by starting at verse 1. He began to teach again by the sea, that's the Sea of Galilee, and such a very large crowd gathered to Him that He got into a boat in the sea and sat down, and the whole crowd was by the sea on the land. And He was teaching them many things in parables, that's analogies, stories, illustrations, and was saying to them in His teaching, listen to this, and here comes this parable, Behold, the sower went out to sow. As he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depths of soil. And after the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. Other seeds fell into the good soil. And as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. And He was saying, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is a simple story that was very familiar in terms of its details to the crowd. Galilee was an agrarian society. Everybody understood this. They understood there was good soil and bad soil. Uh, There there was good soil that was relatively better than other good soil, and there were various reasons why some soil was bad. They got it. It was a simple story. Everybody would understand the story. But what about its spiritual meaning? Well, that was reserved, according to verse 9, for those who had ears to hear, and not everybody did. Everybody understood the story itself, but not everybody understood the meaning of the story. As in all the parables that Jesus told, they intend to convey very, very significant spiritual truth. This one has sweeping breadth, sweeping implications, it has great importance. Though it is a simple story, it's Spiritual meaning is totally lost on the huge crowd. They don't understand what the story means spiritually. Its meaning is totally obscure to them. They are oblivious to it, and that is by intention. They are unbelievers who follow Jesus strictly for the miracles. They are thrill-seekers. They're happy to come along for what is clearly the greatest show on earth, Jesus healing all kinds of diseases, raising dead people, casting out demons, presenting wondrous teaching. They are the thrill-seekers, but they have no interest in the teaching of Jesus. They have no interest in the theology of Jesus. They're there for the miracles. For them, Jesus speaking in parables becomes a judgment, becomes a judgment. 
This is a turning point in His ministry in Galilee. From now on, He never says anything to the crowd except in parables, and He never explains the parables so that they hear but don't understand. They see the imagery but don't comprehend the meaning. This is a judgment. And that's what it tells us in verses 10 through 12. As soon as He was alone, His followers, along with the twelve, began asking Him about the parables. What do they mean? What are you trying to convey? What is the spiritual meaning? And He was saying to them, "'To you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but those who are outside get everything in parables so that...' And He quotes an Old Testament prophecy from Isaiah 6, 9, and 10, "'While seeing they may see and not perceive, while hearing they may hear and not understand, otherwise they might return and be forgiven.'" The indication is it's too late for forgiveness. It's too late for comprehension. They have made up their minds. If you go over to verse 33, later in the same chapter, it says, "'With many such parables He was speaking the Word to them so far as they were able to hear it, and He didn't speak to them without a parable, but He was explaining everything privately to His own disciples.'" And so I say, this is a judgment. This is a judgment. This parable, by the way, and these same statements about who can understand and who won't understand, this parable and those same statements appear in Matthew chapter 13, the parable is repeated there, and also appear in Luke chapter 8. So three of the gospels record the parable and record it as a judgment and make the distinction between the people who cannot hear because they have a fixed rejection of Christ and those who will hear because they are believers in Him. Matthew 13, 10, it's good to hear His account of it. The disciples come to Jesus and they say, "'Why do you speak to them in parables?' Jesus answered them, "'To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. Therefore I speak to them,' verse 13, "'in parables, because while seeing they do not see, while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand.'" Then He says, "'This is to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah.'" Then verse 16, "'Blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear.'" And then over in verses 34 and 35, all these things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables, and He didn't speak to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, "'I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things hidden since the foundation of the world,' words borrowed from Psalm 78, verse 2. Luke 8 says essentially the same thing. So in understanding the ministry of Jesus in telling parables to the crowd, you have to understand this is a divine judgment. This is a moment which freezes the rejection of Jesus. These people who have rejected Christ under the leadership of the apostate Pharisees and scribes and rabbis and the rest, these people now are past the point where they can return and be forgiven. This is a tragic moment in the history of Israel. So in Galilee, where He is ministering, He never again speaks in any teaching without parables, and for the crowd, He never gives them an explanation. This is a divine judgment on their fixed unbelief. On the other hand, however, our Lord gives a full explanation to His followers, the disciples, the apostles, the believers. They are preeminently privileged to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. They, they know the divine spiritual truth that the Lord has revealed to them in these wonderful stories. This is critical for them because how are they going to be used to build the kingdom? How are they going to be used to proclaim the gospel? How are they going to be used when the church is established to, uh, to build the church and strengthen the church and carry the message of the church, the gospel to the ends of the earth? If they don't understand these things, they must understand them. Um, one of the most beautiful portions of Scripture is John 15 where Jesus says, "'You're My friends, and I call you My friends because I have revealed all things that My Father has disclosed to Me to you.'" If you're a friend of the Lord Jesus Christ, what marks that friendship is full disclosure, complete revelation. 
So on the one hand, our Lord speaking in parables is a judgment to the non-believers who are fixed in their rejection. On the other hand, it is an invitation to revelation to His friends to whom the great mysteries of the kingdom will be disclosed in full so that they can have the privilege of knowing this truth and carry out the responsibility of proclaiming it. Now this particular parable is a foundation parable. It's just one of those parables that is absolutely critical to all believers' understanding of spiritual responsibility. The greatest spiritual responsibility we have is the fulfillment of the Great Commission, right? That's why we're here in this world, to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, to proclaim the gospel to every creature, to go to all the nations, to teach men about Christ, to come to Him in faith and repentance. We understand that. Every other mandate in Scripture works toward making us better able to fulfill the Great Commission. That's our ultimate goal. Well, with that in mind, this parable of the soils is the most detailed instruction our Lord ever gave us on evangelism. We know the Great Commission. We were familiar with the, uh, the Great Commission in Matthew. We're familiar with the one in Luke. We're familiar with the commission in Acts chapter 1, the Lord sending us to the ends of the earth to proclaim the gospel. But this goes beyond that and describes what we should expect. This tells us how to get ready for the responses that we're going to have as we carry out this commission. It is an absolutely critical parable to be understood. Sadly, uh, it is not really understood by the church, I'm afraid. If it is understood, it is ignored. If it isn't ignored, it is misinterpreted. And even in some cases where it is rightly interpreted, it is unapplied. It is so definitive, as I said earlier, I, I would not be remiss to, to preach twenty sermons on this parable, for, but I wouldn't do it for fear I would wear you out with this one story. But it is so critical, it is so foundational, it must not be ignored, it must not be misinterpreted, and I have heard many frightening misinterpretations of this. It must not be left unapplied. It has implications on how we do evangelism. Failure to understand this, failure to interpret it correctly, failure to imply the truths in this parable has blighted the church in a very serious way. It has allowed the church to engage in all kinds of foolish and illegitimate strategies for evangelism that are very effective in producing false converts. Maybe never in the history of the church has it been any more efficient than it is now in producing false converts. The church is really good at making hypocrites and even apostates. False conversions abound in the church. The church is very adept at sowing its own tares in the midst of the field. And if you go back to this story and get it right and make application of its truth, the church would become insulated against that kind of folly. The last thing you want to do, the last thing you ever want to do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is produce a false conversion by using some illegitimate means of manipulating people. So I cannot stress how important the instruction of this parable is because it regulates our understanding of evangelism. Back to the explanation. The explanation comes then, uh, starting in verse 13, Jesus says, do you understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? The point is, no, we don't understand. How can we understand? There's only one way. You have to explain them to us. So He does in verse 14, the sower sows the Word. Now, pretty obvious that He doesn't say anything about the sower. There is no adjective in front of sower. He doesn't say the good sower, the clever sower, the adept sower, the savvy sower, the culturally acute sower. He doesn't say any of that, the sower. No description. This is every believer, folks. This is us. This is you, every believer, every believer. We proclaim the gospel. 
Nothing more needs to be said about the sower. It's not about the sower. It's not about the technique of the sower, the skill of the sower. Then it says, so is the Word. Well, the Word is the seed. There's only one seed. That's the gospel. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Romans 1. It is the power of God and the salvation to whoever believes, Jew or Greek. The power is in the gospel. The gospel is the seed. Faith comes by hearing the Word concerning Christ, Romans 10. 1 Corinthians 15, this is the gospel, that Jesus died and rose again. We, we understand the gospel. The gospel is simply summarized as preaching Christ. The, the Great Commission at the end of Luke, our Lord says, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, and all the things which are written about Me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So He opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. The gospel starts in the law, the prophets, and the holy writings, the hagiographer, uh, hagiographer of the Old Testament. You start with the story of Christ all the way back with the law and with the prophets and the Psalms. And then He said, thus it is written that Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in His name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Now go do it. Preach Christ. Preach Christ. Preach the whole history of Christ. As this connection to the Law and the Prophets and the Psalms is the beginning of it all and the fulfillment of it comes in the New Testament, preach Christ. That's the seed. It's the gospel of the Lord. Jesus Christ, the one who fulfills all Old Testament prophecy. So there's really no discussion here about the sower. Every believer is a sower, and there's no discussion about the seed. There's only one possible seed, and that's the story of Christ. That's the story of Christ. It is Christ. The gospel is Christ. We preach Christ. Paul says, I'm determined to know nothing among you except Christ and Him crucified. And they said about Paul, his speech was contemptible, his, he lacked personal charm, he had nothing going for him. He was boring. He didn't get into the, any of the philosophical labyrinths that teased the minds of people. He had this, this consistent, simplistic message about a crucified Jew. That's all he preached. He didn't try to embellish it. It was the pure gospel. And as we all know, God used Him mightily. So all of us are sowers and we have the seed which is the gospel concerning Jesus Christ. Uh, just a footnote, I was reading some of Spurgeon this week and Spurgeon, um, he was very insightful even in his day and he hated the invitation system that was popular. and. In uh, his day where preachers would say, uh, come forward to this altar or come into this inquiry room and talk to this counselor or talk to this person. And he said, drive everyone to Christ, drive everyone to Christ, drive everyone to Christ. The only hope of salvation is found in Christ. Don't offer a counselor. Don't offer uh, the byproducts of Christ. Offer Christ and Christ only. That's the gospel. Preach Christ. And so the sower is every believer, the seed is the gospel of Christ. So the issue left for us is the soils, right? This is the key. Soils represent the human heart. Matthew 13, 19, the parallel passage refers to the seed going into the soil as the gospel being sown in the heart, in the heart. So here we have hearts that we're going to face as we go to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. Very, very important. First of all, Verse 15 is the roadside heart. These are the ones who are beside the road uh, where the seed is sown. When they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the Word which has been sown in them. This is the seed that falls on hard, beaten path. It's like concrete, no response at all. They are described in 2 Corinthians 4, as we read earlier, as those whose minds are blinded by Satan. Satan comes along and snatches the truth away before it can ever penetrate. This is not some oblique group of people. This is, a, this is Israel. They are the hard-hearted and stiff-necked just like their ancestors. You remember when Jesus went into the synagogue in Nazareth and preached one sermon according in Luke 4, they tried to throw Him off a cliff and stone Him to death because He attacked their hard-heartedness. He reminded them of the story in the past that God wanted to 
benefit a widow in Israel but couldn't find a righteous widow, so he had to go and take care of a Gentile widow. And he wanted to heal a leper, but there, there were none worthy of being healed in Israel, so he went and healed a border terrorist who pillaged and raped the Jews by the name of Naaman. They were so infuriated by being reminded of how stiff-necked and hard-hearted they were that they wanted to kill Jesus, but that was the way they were. Hard, impenitent heart. So he's describing the vast population of Israel, the Jews and their religious leaders who had rejected Him, for whom it was now too late, and He was speaking to them in stories without an explanation because He was hiding the truth from them. He was no longer going to cast pearls before swine. Then you remember the rocky here in verses 16 and 17 in a similar way, there are ones on whom the seed was sown in the rocky places who when they hear the Word immediately receive it with joy. They have no firm root in themselves but are only temporary. Then when affliction or persecution arises because of the Word, immediately they fall away. Get ready to expect temporary converts. Now, these are shallow responders, false converts who respond emotionally without counting the cost, selfishly seeking personal satisfaction. This rises, frankly, out of self-love. There are people who say, oh, yeah, I, I, I certainly want that. I, I want Jesus if, if He can uh, uh, take care of my life and forgive my sin and take me to heaven, but it's all very self-centered. Jonathan Edwards uh, was well aware of this when he wrote a treatise concerning religious affections in 1746. Uh, he said that fallen human nature is fertile ground for fleshly religiosity, impiously spiritual but ultimately rooted in self-love. Folks, that dominates evangelicalism today, a self-centered, self-love fleshly religiosity, an impious spirituality that wants Jesus only because Jesus will deliver what this person emotionally needs. High emotional experiences, Edward said, effusive, gushy religious talk, even praising God and experiencing love for God in feelings can be self-centered and self-motivated. This is aided and abetted by the charismatic movement and all its tentacles that go everywhere, driving people emotionally to do things that have nothing to do with a real conversion. In contrast to this, Jonathan Edwards talked of experiences of genuine salvation from the Holy Spirit as always being God-centered in character, based on worship, having an appreciation for God's grandeur, divorced completely from any self-interest. Edwards pointed out that genuine conversion creates humility in the convert rather than pride, a spirit of meekness, gentleness, forgiveness, and mercy, and leaves the true believer hungering and thirsting for righteousness instead of being satisfied with some kind of self-congratulation. This happens constantly where there is a, an emotional appeal or appeal to people's will divorced from clear instruction regarding God's holy hatred of sin. Who does the Lord seek? He seeks those who are of a broken and a contrite spirit who tremble at My Word, who literally shudder under the authority of God. Now, false conversions happen all the time. And the issue is not peop the, that people don't believe in Jesus Christ. That's not the part that creates false conversions. There are lots of falsely converted people who will tell you they believe Jesus lived, they believe Jesus died, they believe Jesus rose again. That is relatively easier to accept. What makes a false conversion is a failure at genuine repentance, at genuine repentance. The quote-unquote Christian church is full of all kinds of people who believe in Jesus Christ. The devils believe, James 2.19, devil faith. But it's about the holy hatred of sin. It's about brokenness. It's about self-denial. It's about repentance. Spurgeon said, there are people who come forward under an emotional appeal 
and then immediately go backward into their sin. He said they go into the inquiry room and get converted in five minutes and have nothing to do with godliness the rest of their lives. So he was dealing with the same kind of false conversions in his day. It's always this temptation in the church to cheapen evangelism, and all it does is create superficiality. Look, false converts are going to happen anyway. Aiding and abetting them is not acceptable. There's going to be rocky soil even under the correct presentation of the gospel. Accommodating the gospel to that is a gross sin. Mere emotion has nothing to do with evangelism. Look, they had seen that too. They had seen the hard-hearted populace. They also knew there had been disciples, as recorded in John 6, 61 to uh, to 71, who followed for a while and then turned around and left. And Jesus gave a a reverse invitation, will you also go away? Why don't you all leave? There's a new approach to an invitation. Why don't you all just reject me? All of you leave. The ones that remained stood up and said, we're not going to go anywhere. You're, you're, the ones with, you're the one with eternal life. We know who you are, the Holy One of God. So they had seen the kinds of people who when there's any kind of pressure or anything they don't believe or anything they don't want to submit to or any kind of persecution arising on the horizon, they disappear. And they're still with us. We don't aid and abet that by superficial emotional approaches in evangelism. If someone's confession of Christ doesn't come from a deep inner contrition, a broken and a contrite heart, a desire to be delivered from sin and come under the holy lordship of Jesus Christ in a life of self-denial and sacrifice and service and even suffering, then you have no root. You have no root. 